I'm excited to welcome Dr. Emily Forbes. So Dr. Forbes is a board certified neurologist. She has fellowship training in movement disorders. She first got her master's degree and medical degree at the New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. And then she completed residency in neurology here at University of Colorado and a two-year fellowship in movement disorders at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the Pennsylvania VA. And she runs our uh, University of Colorado Neurogenetics Clinic. And her research interests include understanding factors that affect the progression of Parkinson's, cognitive impairment in Parkinson's, and understanding the genetic basis of neurologic disease. So she's going to talk to us about the genetics of Parkinson's. So welcome, Dr. Forbes. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? All right, so today we're going to talk about decoding Parkinson's disease, how genetic discoveries are shaping the future of care. For some disclosures, I'm an investigator on several clinical trials that we'll talk about today. So we'll start with how do genes work? So genes are like tiny instruction manuals. Sorry? Closer, okay, better? Okay. Genes are like tiny instruction manuals that are inside all of our cells. And so in the image on the left there, you can see how DNA, nucleic acids are packed into chromosomes and all of these are in each of our cells. Genes provide instructions on how to make proteins, which then go to carry out the function of our cells. And we have two copies of each of our genes, one from mom and one from dad. And genes control everything from things like eye color, height, dimples, as well as things like disease risk. So why are we looking at genetics? So sometimes when I suggest genetic testing for Parkinson's disease in clinic, people are surprised because it's not something that is typically or historically thought of as a genetic disease. But as it turns out, about 15% of people with Parkinson's have a genetic cause. And so when we get genetic testing, genetic testing gives you valuable information about yourself. So a lot of people ask us when they get diagnosed, why did they develop Parkinson's? And for most people, we really can't tell them why. But for the percentage who have a genetic predisposition, we can give them information about why they developed PD. And there's also some information in there about prognosis. So for example, some genetic forms of Parkinson's can have an earlier onset with more cognitive changes, and some genetic forms can have less cognitive changes. And that is something we're still working out in research right now. Genetic testing also gives us valuable information about Parkinson's disease. So whenever we discover a gene that's associated with Parkinson's disease, it gives us information about a pathway or a protein that is dysfunctional that can lead to PD. And so this provides us with what we call a therapeutic target or an area that we can research that potentially can produce a treatment in the future. So I'll give you a little information about the background of genetics and Parkinson's. So Parkinson's was first described and published in 1817 by Dr. James Parkinson. And it wasn't until almost 100 years later that they found, when they looked at cells in the brain, people with Parkinson's, they found these things called Lewy bodies. And so you can see that on the bottom left, there's that cell and there's that pink circle in it with an arrow pointing to it. That's a Lewy body. That is a bunch of alpha synuclein, which is a protein, all clumped up together. A few years later, in 1953, the uh, structure of DNA was discovered. And it wasn't until several years later that levodopa, or the component of cinnamon, was found to be helpful for Parkinson's. And so then we'll fast forward by a few decades to the 90s. And this is really when genetics started to become informative in Parkinson's disease. So before the late 90s, there was no known genetic cause of PD. But then an Italian family was being treated and they noticed, their physicians and scientists noticed, every single generation was affected. And they thought there has to be some genetic component to this. And they actually found a gene, SNCA. And that SNCA gene, goes to make alpha-synuclein, which is what causes Lewy bodies, gets aggregated in the cell. And so the first thing that scientists did was they thought, did we find the genetic cause of Parkinson's? So they started testing everyone and they found it to be largely absent. And so this kind of speaks to the complexity of the genetics of Parkinson's and of Parkinson's disease in general. Over the next few decades, they did find several more genes associated with Parkinson's. And in fact, more recently, about 30 years, almost 30 years after that initial dis uh, genetic discovery was made, there are more than 100 genes that have been linked to Parkinson's disease. 
So the image on the right, you can see the circles or the there's a big circle with numbers all around it. Those numbers go up to 22. That represents each of our chromosomes. And then the middle part, you can see names of genes. So this picture is about four years old. And since then, we've had so many genetic discoveries that there are dozens more genes that are associated with Parkinson's. Some of you might have heard of the Parkinson's Foundation PD generation study. So the purpose of the study is to better understand the genetic architecture of Parkinson's. And in the years that they've been active, they've had 15,000 people send in genetic information. So if anyone here has contributed to this, we thank you very much for participating in this research. Uh, they found that 13% of people have a genetic form of PD, which is similar to what we think of about 15. And in fact, 18% of people who sent in um, genetic information who had high risk status, meaning they were young onset, or they had a first degree relative with Parkinson's or a high risk ancestry, almost 20% of those people had a genetic cause. And so from their data, they say that 7.7% of participants had GBA and 2.1% of participants had LARC2. So those are the two most common risk factors. And then they also mentioned this other gene, Parkin. So let's talk a little bit more about the genes. When we test people for Parkinson's, what genes are we looking for? Uh, and you can see on this graph, there's a whole bunch of genes. Um, the Oh, it's just going on its own there. So... The bottom, the x-axis on the bottom shows that the gene is rare, uncommon, or common. And then the y-axis shows its effect size. And so what we can see on the bottom right is the common genes. So we have genes that are very common in the population for people who might never develop Parkinson's disease. They have a small effect size. Then on the left side, you can see the rare genes in those red circles. They have a large effect size. So those are rare, but the people who get them are very likely to develop Parkinson's. And then we have these two genes in the middle, the GBA and LARC2 that I had mentioned from um, the Parkinson's Foundation PD generation study. These are the most common risk factors. So they have a moderate effect size, meaning they're risk factors for people, sorry, it's doing this on its own, <laughs> risk factors for people to develop Parkinson's disease. So we're gonna focus on these two in the middle. So first we'll talk about GBA. GBA encodes the protein glucose reversidase. Remember, genes are instruction manuals to make proteins. This is the protein made by GBA, glucose reversidase. It's present in about 2 to 30% of people with Parkinson's. And people who have a mutation in one GBA gene, because we get one copy from mom, one copy from dad. So if you have one copy of this GBA gene that's mutated, it increases the risk of developing Parkinson's disease to about 10 to 30%, depending on some other things like ancestry. Now, people with GBA variants tend to present at a little bit of an earlier age, about three to six years earlier than the average Parkinson's patient. They often have more cognitive impairment and have a higher risk of dementia. They often have hallucinations and they have more higher risk for sleep behavior disorder. Um, so how does this help us? So GBA provides insights for new treatments. And so this is one of the reasons why this is so important. The glucose reversidase that GBA provides instructions for helps with housekeeping in our cells. So it keeps our cells clean and tidy. When there's not enough glucose reversidase, people are at an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. So the question is, if it's not active enough in people with this mutation, can activating that glucose reversidase or giving people a medication that can increase its activity, can that help slow down the course of Parkinson's disease? And so that's what a lot of neurologists and some neuroscientists have asked. And so you might be wondering, where are we gonna get a medication that will improve the function of the glucose reversidase? And so there are two broad ways to do that. The first is looking at one of the many medications that are out there. So we have thousands of medications for all different diseases. And so the idea is, can we look at what we call the pharmacokinetics or um, the biochemistry of one of these pills that's already out there, already being used, just to see if by chance does it improve the function of glucose reversidase? And so this has been done, and it's actually found that there is a medication out there, it's called Embroxyl, it's available in Europe, um, that improves the function of glucose reversidase. And there have been several studies on this. So one was the EMPD study, which found that ambroxyl seems to be safe and well-tolerated and can potentially increase glucose reversidase levels. 
And so right now there are at least eight ongoing studies in this, mostly in Europe, that are looking at this medication specifically to see if it can slow down the course of Parkinson's or slow down the course of cognitive impairment in Parkinson's. So that's one way to find a medication. The other way is to develop a new drug from scratch specifically to improve the function of that enzyme. And so that's what's being done in this ACTIVATE trial. So this is a phase two trial. It has enrolled 237 participants. So if anyone is enrolled in this, we thank you for that. A lot of clinical trials get delayed because it's hard to enroll and find people who are interested in the trial, who are a good match for the trial. And so this enrolled very quickly. They actually stopped enrollment just a couple of weeks ago. And so that's very exciting. It's for people with Parkinson's disease and a GBA mutation. And people in this trial are randomly assigned a placebo or the investigational drug at one of two doses. And they're gonna be monitored for up to 78 weeks. And the goal is to look at the Parkinson's rating scale. And so that's when we have people do all the taps. A lot of you might be familiar with that. Um, and see if that stays steady over the course of the trial, or if it progresses the way we typically think of Parkinson's as progressing. And also to make sure it is safe and tolerable. All right, so we're going to move on to our second gene that we talked about, LERP2. So this stands for leucine rich repeat kinase 2. So that's the name of this protein product that provides instructions to make this kinase. Mutation, mutations in LARP2 are uncommon, higher in certain populations, like Ashkenazi Jewish or North African Berber. And the symptoms in people with LARP2 are pretty similar to the symptoms in people with non-genetic Parkinson's disease. So how does this help us? How does this provide insights for new treatments? So mutation in LARP2 actually increases the activity of its protein product. So it makes a protein that is too active and so the goal of treatment is to inhibit or try to decrease the function of that protein. And so there is a study looking at a new investigational drug that does just that. And this one is actively recruiting. So we're trying to find people who are interested in this study now. So I put the information, in case you are interested in hearing more, I put information on how to reach us via email or phone on the bottom. The phone number will go to a voicemail, but it is checked regularly. And you are welcome to ask any questions uh, anytime this morning if you have questions about the trial. It's a phase 2B multi-center study. It's occurring at about 110 sites globally. The recruitment goal is 640 participants. People will be randomized to receive either placebo or the investigational drug, and then monitored over the course of several years. And the goals of the study, again, the Parkinson's rating scale, to see if that is stable or if it continues to progress the same way we think uh, as Parkinson's usually regress, uh, progresses, and to make sure it is safe and tolerable. The big thing about this study is if someone's interested or knows somebody who might be interested, uh, please come talk to me or um, one of the research, someone at the research table. The big requirement is we're looking for people who have not yet started levodopa or medications for Parkinson's. So that makes it really difficult to recruit for. But again, happy to answer all questions about this. And then we have some upcoming trials, including a phase two trial, looking at another investigational, investigational drug to decrease LARP2 activity in people with Parkinson's, again, not taking medication like Cinemet for Parkinson's, um, and people who have a LARP2 mutation. So I'll come back to my question from the beginning, which is why, are, why look at genetics? So each genetic discovery brings us closer to finding a new treatment. New pathways are discovered that are affected in Parkinson's that potentially could be therapeutic targets, and new proteins are discovered, which could potentially be therapeutic targets. And really importantly is the treatment that is used for people with genetic mutations can potentially be used to help people even without genetic Parkinson's. So understanding the genetic architecture of Parkinson's disease is really a worldwide effort. And so this outlines some of the various studies that are ongoing right now to better understand this and to provide new pathways to finding a cure. We talked about PD generation. There's also something called GP2, which is trying to better, again, understand the, the genetic architecture of Parkinson's disease. Um, there's the ASAP, which is align, aligning science across Parkinson's, and they're working with the GP2 group. There's something called large BD, which is trying to be more inclusive and look at people from Latin America to try to determine a different genetic pathways. 
And then on the top right, you can see there was a paper that was recently published about a multi-ancestry analysis using the information from these genetic databases. They found several new variants and up to 25 potential risk genes that can cause Parkinson's disease. So this is really very helpful for finding a potential treatment. And a few years ago, the University of Colorado got some funding to start our own Parkinson's disease genetic registry. So we're trying to also contribute to this worldwide effort. So we'll talk a little bit about the future of personalized care in Parkinson's disease. This is something that we're really right on the cusp of, where someone with a diagnosis with, with Parkinson's disease will lead to a genetic test. And so we do this pretty routinely at our university. A lot of universities uh, perform genetic testing, but it doesn't happen everywhere. Our goal is in the future, once a genetic cause is found, there will be a personalized treatment approach. And potentially, even in people with no known genetic cause, the therapies that were developed using the genetic information can be used for people with non-genetic PD. So a quick summary, genetics cause about 15% of cases of PD. GBA and Mark II are the most common risk factors. And acceleration in clinical trials for genetic forms of PD provide hope for a disease-modifying therapy. So with that, I would like to thank everyone. I just wanna say that you are more than your genes. These are just things we were born with. We can't do anything about them, but all the things that Dr. Bierler had just talked about with exercise and diet really set up your genes to work optimally. And so that is the most that we can do right now, but please uh, ask any questions and I'll leave the research information up here. Thank you.